1 John chapter 1 this morning. We're going to read the whole chapter, 1 John chapter 1. Start with verse 1, read down in the chapter. And uh, the Bible says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We ought to read the next two verses. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for your blessings. We thank you, God, for the opportunity we have to be in the church house this morning. We ask God you might bless those that are in attendance this morning and those that may be listening online today. We ask God the Holy Spirit might empower the words that are spoken. May there be a help and a blessing to each one that listens. We pray, God, that for anybody that's not saved, that God, they would come to Christ as their Savior. And for Christians, we pray, God, you might help us, Lord, to learn something today that will help us to enjoy the forgiveness that we have in thee. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, 1 John chapter 1 here is not talking about salvation. Uh, the context of 1 John 1 is fellowship. Forgiveness and fellowship. Not forgiveness in relation to getting saved, but forgiveness in relation to fellowship with the Lord. And um, we could say this, and that is when a person gets saved, they establish a new relationship with God through the new birth. They get born again. But after you're saved, you have to, you have to maintain your fellowship with the Lord. And that's through confession of sin. Uh, and just staying right with God on a daily basis. Not to maintain your salvation, but to maintain your fellowship. The relationship was established when you got born again. That's irreversible. But fellowship, that's something that can be messed with and be, be disrupted uh, by us not living right and not staying in fellowship with the Lord. So I'm going to talk to you this day on this uh, subject, and that is enjoying God's forgiveness. Enjoying God's forgiveness. If there's anything we ought to enjoy, it's the forgiveness that God offers to humanity and He offers to us and that we've accepted and received when we got saved. And it says, all of us who have trusted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, uh, we know that even though we have been saved, we still disobey, we still disappoint our Heavenly Father uh, at times. Uh, great men and women of the Bible, though God's people, failed God at some time or another. Uh, you look throughout the entire Bible, you read the stories of men and women's lives in the Bible, you're going to find some failures in there, amen? You're going to find people who did well, did good, did right, but they all had failure. They all had sin. Uh, matter of fact, he said there, he said, if we say we have not sinned, uh, we make him a liar and his word's not in us. If we say that we have no sin, uh, he says we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so the fact is we are sinful beings still, even though we're saved. And, but every one of us are going to fail God at some point, and maybe more than once. The only person who never sinned against God was his son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, in whom had, he, had, he had no sin in him, and uh, he had no sin upon him, amen? He was not a sinner. He's the only one that was perfect and that pleased God in everything he said, did, and thought. Now, it's a blessing to know that God does forgive, and it's a great personal blessing to know that God has forgiven your sin. And it's a great personal blessing to me to know that God has forgiven my sins, amen? Uh, Psalm 32, 1, the, the, uh, uh, the psalmist, the palmist, how many heard that this week? The palmist, amen? Hey, the palmist, I was saying it wrong the whole time. It's the palmist, amen? The psalmist said in Psalm 32, 1. How many getting that? Amen. All right. The psalmist. Uh, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. When you got saved, God forgave you your sins and uh, he covered your sins. He atoned for your sins and uh, you're no longer guilty before God. 
you're now uh, righteous in the sight of God because of Christ imputed righteousness. Not ours, but his. Amen. I'm not saved by my righteousness. I'm saved by the righteousness of somebody else. And that somebody else is perfect, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Right. That's how I'm saved. Now, when a person accepts Christ as their Savior and becomes a Christian, God forgives that person's sins, past, present, and future. And in God's sight, a believer is forgiven, he's justified, he's redeemed, he's adopted, he's regenerated, uh, he's reconciled, and he's sanctified. All those things occur when you get saved. And from God's viewpoint, um, you're saved, your sins have been washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. But from time to time, a person, uh, uh, you take, uh, when a person places their faith and trust in Christ, that's something that's final and forever, and that's a doctrinal truth when you get saved. But from a practical standpoint, we still sin. We still need to be forgiven on a regular basis through confession of sins in order to, uh, uh, to have our fellowship maintained between us and the Heavenly Father. And uh, so now, once we've confessed our sin to God, which he says in verse 9, if we confess our sins to God, once we've confessed our sin to God and claimed his forgiveness, we can know that we're forgiven. Why? Based on the promise of God. Verse, one, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you forget, if you confess your sins, God says, I'm going to forgive those sins. Um, just so that you can stay in fellowship with him. Now, um, there are times when we don't feel forgiven. And we don't experience the joy of being forgiven. Verse 4, he said, these things are right unto you that your joy may be full. God wants you to be happy in Christ. Amen. He wants to have joy in your heart. And he, wants to, he wants you to be able to experience the joy of His salvation in your life. Amen? But sin is what gets in the way. And sometimes that sin might be just simply doubting what God said. But God said, if you, for, if you ask me to forgive you, if you confess your sin, He said, I will forgive it, whether you feel like it or not. But uh, in the times that uh, you don't feel forgiven, uh, then and that inner assurance is not there, uh, there's some things you can do, I believe, to help that out, to help fix that. And we're going to talk about that this morning. How to enjoy God's forgiveness. Uh, it's possible to feel forgiven and not be forgiven. Just as it's possible to be, to be forgiven and maybe you don't feel forgiven. Uh, and that's because many times we trust in our feelings instead of living by faith. Uh, sometimes you just have a bad day. Sometimes you just wake up and you need a cup of coffee or a shower or something, Amen. Sometimes you just walk out, and, and, and when it's 40, 50, uh, 40 degrees outside, just walk out and wake up, amen? Sometimes you just got to get the blood flowing. But sometimes uh, it's the devil uh, messing with you and your spiritual life, and there might be something between you and God that you're not really dealing with that may be hindering you from enjoying the fellowship and the, uh, the joy of your salvation. So I want to mention several steps that you and I can take to experience God's forgiveness uh, once we've repented and confessed those sins to our Heavenly Father. Amen. A couple things this morning. One thing you can do is this. Be sure to stay in the Word of God. Be sure to stay in the Word of God. Uh, when two parties are at odds with each other, like a married couple sometimes are, they stop communicating. Uh, silence reigns in the home. Uh, but when things are made right and forgiveness is sought out and obtained, parts and lips are opened again, and there is communication. The walls come down, the bridges are restored. But that doesn't happen without some kind of communication, some kind of confession there if you've done wrong. If you've done wrong, I mean, if your wife says you did something wrong, just agree to it, amen? Get it over with, amen? You don't argue over that stuff, amen? Um, but uh, God the Father wants to talk to us, uh, and he does that through what? His Word. That's how he speaks to us, amen? Uh, sometimes he'll speak through a sermon if it's based on the Word of God. Sometimes he'll speak through a Sunday school lesson. Sometimes he'll speak to, through an individual that says something to you that helps you out. But it has to be based on the Word of God, amen? It has to be based in the Word of God. Uh, God the Father, again, wants to talk to us. He speaks to us through his Word. And after you've repented and been restored to fellowship with the Lord, you've got to turn back to his Word and let God speak to you. Uh, many a time, you'll read your Bible and not get nothing out of it. And it may be because you've got unconfessed sin there and you're not dealing with that. And if you're not dealing with it, then God doesn't speak to you. You can read the Bible, you can read the words of the Bible, you can look at them, you can memorize them, but they may not really speak to your heart if you're not saved. Or number two, if you're out of fellowship with God as a Christian. God may just not speak to you. So you've got to spend time meditating on the Scriptures after you've confessed and made those things right with God. Spend time meditating on the scriptures. Think about what the Bible says. Read a verse and think about what it says. 
Now, I know we, 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 we always tell people, God, you should read your, we encourage people to read their Bibles every day. We encourage people to read your Bible through at least once a year. But I encourage you not just to do that, but to read the Bible for all it's worth. And sometimes you'll read a verse of Scripture, and you've got to stop right there to try to find out what that verse means. And maybe you'll be reading along, and a, and a verse will just kind of just jump out at you, and God says, hey, and he's got that one directed right at you. Sometimes it's like that. He'll give you what you need when you need it, amen? you just got to keep reading. Again, if you'll meditate on the Scriptures on a regular basis, the old truths may take on a new meaning, and new truths will jump out from familiar verses that maybe you didn't see before, or you have forgotten, amen? Sometimes we just forget, and we've got to be reminded of things. We've got to be reminded of the Scripture. That's why we've got to read our Bibles. That's why we've got to come to church, to be reminded many a time of what God says and what God has for us. Uh, God's words are like a healing medicine that will mend a broken heart that has repented and made things right. And the joy of your salvation will return as you realize that God is speaking to you once again from the pages of the Bible. So it's always a blessing when you read your Bible and you get something from it. Amen? And you're not going to get nothing from it unless... You're right with God in your heart. You've got to be right with Him in your heart. Uh, you may get some things from the Scripture that may help you out. God may try to encourage you. He may try to rebuke you. He's still going to speak to you, but not like you want many a time if you're not got those sins confessed and you're right with God and getting in the Word of God, Word of God in the Bible. Um, so they say if when you read the Word of God and you sense that God is silent and not speaking to you, you need to humbly search your heart and be sure that your confession of sin was complete and sincere. Not just, uh, you know, Lord, now lay me down to sleep, forgive me all my sins I committed today. You've got to get specific with God about things. When you confess something, you've got to confess what you did wrong. You've got to confess it to the Lord. You know, if you go to court um, and you have to confess to something, they don't want you to be God and honest with yourself to do that. So you've got to make sure that your confession of sin to God was complete and it was sincere. Um, you've got to ask yourself, am I hiding something from God? Uh, am I trying to bargain with God over this thing? Uh, was it true repentance? Uh, was I sorry for what I did or was I sorry that I got caught? And that's the difference between repentance and just simply you know, feeling bad about what you did. Um, God's desire in Psalm 51, 6, he said to David, when David committed his great sin... David said, God desires truth in the inward parts. He wants my heart to be right. He wants my spirit to be right. God just is not looking for some superficial, surface confession that's just in total generalities. He wants to know, what did you do? And get that thing right. Now, you may go through a whole day, and maybe you've done, maybe you've done well. I hope that you have. Some days you may go through the whole day thinking, have I done anything wrong to confess? Maybe you haven't. But you want to you make sure it's covered at the end of the day, amen. And say, Lord, if I have messed up, please forgive me. Bring it to my mind. Bring it to my attention. Search my heart, O oh God, and see if there be any evil way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. That's what David prayed. So God, I mean, maybe I missed something today. Let me make sure my the books are clear today and that my record's clear today and that we're good with each other as we go into the evening hours and I lay my head down. Make sure my heart is right with God. And uh, do that. Uh, but if there's something specific, you've got to deal with that. So stay in the Word of God. Second, let me say this. Make things right with those you may have wronged. Make things right with those that you've wronged. Have you ever wronged anybody? You ever done anybody wrong? You've got to make it right. You can't go through life without making it right. If you're not right with your brother, you can't be right with God. Look what he says here in 1 John chapter 1 again. Look what he says. He says this. He says um, in verse number 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with God? No, with us. John says, I want you to have fellowship with me and, the, and, and my companions, with us, fellow believers. He said, have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. But I believe in here he's also talking about fellowship with your fellow human beings. That is, if you're right with God, you're going to be right with man to the best of your ability. If you're right with man, you may not be right with God, but if you're a Christian, you've got to have that horizontal, is that right? horizontal relationship, amen, and that uh, vertical relationship. So you can't be right with one and wrong with the other and be right with God. You've got to stay right with, uh, vertically and horizontally. 
And so before you and I step into sin, let me say this, before we step into sin, there's always a spiritual decline in our lives. And during that time, it's easy to hurt those closest to us and around us, those we live with, those we work with, those we go to church with. It's easy to hurt folks when you're declining spiritually and you're not doing anything to stop it. And you may do it and not even know you're doing it. Uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter, um, uh, I forget which verse it is right now, but it says, no, Romans 14. He said, no man liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. What that means is this. You can live your life all you want to, but your life has an effect on other people. Your effect bears, uh, uh, can, can hurt someone else or help somebody else. Why? Because you don't live just to yourself. Everything you do has an effect on people around you. And so you've got to be careful how you live. Because I'm just going to live my life the way I want to. Well, i got news for you. That's not Christian. If you're going to live your life like you want to, and you don't really care and give a flip what anybody thinks, you're not much of a Christian. You've got the wrong attitude, the wrong spirit. That's what you have. Now, you should say that. Now, Paul said in one place, he said, he said uh, if I'm going to live for God, he said, I've got to choose whether or not I'm going to please God or please man. All right? So now, when it comes to your spiritual life, you've got to please God. But that doesn't mean you don't care how you affect other people around you. There's a way of doing it. I could say, I could say this thing two ways. I was thinking the other day. I had, I had somebody I had to talk to, and I thought, how do I approach this? Do I say... You're not, you're not that stupid, are you? Or how about this? You know, you're smarter than that. I just told him in a nice way. You're not that stupid, are you? But I said in a nice way, he said. You're smarter than aren't you're smarter than that, aren't you? Are you? Okay, all right. They make me wonder. But anyway, um, you can do tremendous damage to those around you if you don't do it, if you don't do right, amen, and take care of your own business. So if your confession is sincere, then uh, you're going to want to do everything possible to correct things and make matters right with those that you offended. If you go to God and say, Lord, forgive me for what I've done and said, and I've hurt somebody and hurt so-and-so and hurt this or hurt the church or whoever, God says, okay, good, I forgive you for that. Now you need to go talk to them and apologize and make it right. That's where it gets tough. Um, when you pray and read your Bible and go to church, and the Holy Spirit convicts you of mistreating someone, you ought to go to them and make it right. And sometimes an apology is in order. Forgiveness is one thing. Apologizing is another. Sometimes you've got to make an apology. You can turn to Matthew chapter 5 if you want to. Matthew chapter 5, part of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, some of this stuff doctrinally doesn't really apply to us in the church age, but there's some practical things here we need to look at. Look at Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 5, starting verse number 21. Jesus Christ says this. He says, You have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. He says it's okay to be angry, but just make sure you've got a reason for it. You just can't be mad at somebody without a cause. Sometimes you've got a reason to be mad at somebody that's a righteous reason. Other times it's just because, uh, you know, it's not a righteous reason. It's just uh, you've got bent out of shape over something. You've got offended. But he says here, um, Whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. Rekha means, it's a general all-purpose word. It simply means a good for nothing. Just a general purpose word for somebody that's just good for nothing. Um, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Look at verse 23. This one I want you to notice. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, that is, if you're going to bring an offering to the Lord, to the altar there at the temple, and there remembers that thy brother hath ought against thee. You bring your offering to the Lord, you bring your gift, your sacrifice to the Lord. In the New Testament right now, the church age would be like, I come to church and I put the money in the plate and I come to the altar and pray. And if I come to the altar... And uh, I leave my gift before the altar, and then I go my way. I'm, I'm sorry, look at verse number uh, 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. Just something comes to your mind. The Holy Spirit just brings it to your attention. Oh, yeah. Don't you remember you offended so-and-so? Or so and so is offended by you? Don't you remember that? Here you're trying to get right with God and stay right with God. And God says, okay, I appreciate the offering, the sacrifice, the gift, but don't forget... You need to make this thing right. 
Look what he says in verse number 24. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. He said the first thing you need to do is get reconciled with your brother when God forbids you. You may be going through all the motions of being a Christian, coming to church, carrying your Bible, singing the Psalms, uh, putting your money in the plate, uh, coming down the altar at the end of the service and praying and things like that. Or you just fellowship with one another. As you're walking around, you, there's something inside of you saying, man, you cringe a little bit because you know you offended somebody. And you've got to make that thing right. You've got to make it right. In a small church, it's even worse. It's harder to do that because we can see everybody. We can't hide behind nobody in here, amen? amen. Especially since we read to the pews like we did. <laughs> everybody sees everybody now, amen? Um, but uh, anyway... In a local church or in your family or at work or wherever it is, when you've offended somebody and God reminds you that, you need to be reconciled to your brother in Christ, amen, and your sister in Christ. Um, some people might take this too far. Some do. Uh, a preacher said a woman in his congregation used to uh, ask her forgiveness for things that she thought about. That doesn't help the pastor member relationship. If I was to tell you what I think about you, Forgive me, brother, but I've been thinking some things about you. They're all true. And you tell them. That doesn't help our fellowship, amen? Hey, some things are best not said, amen? So you don't have to tell everything. You ain't got to tell everything that you think. But some people do that, and they'll do that, and in doing that, uh, they, I guess they're trying to make themselves feel like, you know, they just feel like, well, I've felt this, I've thought this about somebody, and, you know, all sin is equal, and so, you know, thinking is just as bad as doing it, so I've thought these things about you, so I'm going to tell you what I think about you. You probably just lost a friend. Amen? You probably just offended somebody. And then you'll say, well, the Bible said if you love the Word of God, you won't be offended about nothing. So it's His fault. How many of you have heard that? Well, that's not what that verse is talking about, by the way. It's not talking about somebody insulting you. If you love the Word of God enough, you're not going to slap them or something. That's not talking about that. Um, but anyway, um, it doesn't help a relationship, a fellowship, when you do that kind of thing. You don't have to tell everything that you think about somebody. Um, as long as the sin is known only to you and the Lord, don't make it public. Keep it between you and God. Amen? Keep it between you and the Lord. Things will be fine. Um, now, when we've sinned openly against someone, then we need to deal with it openly and personally. The wider the consequence of your sin, the broader must be the confession. But don't be dwelling on every thought and thinking you have to tell on yourself all the time. Uh, there's some people that have what uh, I've heard called an overdeveloped conscience. And that is, I mean, every time they have a thought or anything whatsoever, they've got to make it right with so and so. I'm sorry, brother, I'm sorry I had that thought about you, that evil thought about you, brother. I'm sorry I had that. And, you know, would you please forgive me? Well, yeah, I forgive you. Uh, but, by the way, what was it you were thinking about me? <laughs> Don't ask that question, amen. Don't ask that question. Uh, but um, that's how it goes sometimes. An overdeveloped conscience. Sometimes people want to confess things. Uh, someone might say, well, I've confessed it to the Lord, so I don't have to apologize to anybody else. And then there's that extreme. One extreme is I've got to tell everybody. I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to spill my guts about everything that's going on with me, what I think about so-and-so, and this and that, whatever. And then some of them simply say, well, I've confessed it to God, I got it right with God, and that's all that counts, and I don't have to apologize to anybody else. But yet that verse we just read there, Matthew 5, verse 24, he says there, you need to first be reconciled to thy brother if you're going to be right with God. Um, you take the attitude that I don't have to apologize to anybody, that may indicate a person hasn't truly repented and isn't really right with God. Uh, a broken heart towards God won't be hard-hearted toward man. And uh, if I've humbled myself before God, then I should be able to humble myself before the, one of his children, amen? I mean, if I had to admit I was wrong to God to get saved, that's a big admission. Certainly I can admit before another sinner on two feet that, hey, hey, you know, I'm sorry for what I did to you. If you can apologize to God, certainly you can apologize to a man of the flesh that you offended. Um, but some people can't do that. Why? Because they're too proud. Too proud. They're too proud to get right and stay right with their fellow man. 
And men that were just self-righteous, self-justifying, and uh, you can see that. Uh, such a proud attitude of self-righteousness no doubt grieves the Holy Spirit more than just about anything in the body of Christ, I imagine. And if we want to experience the joy of forgiveness, we need to be sure that things are right between us and our fellow Christians. Amen? Uh, number three, let me say this. After you've confessed your sins, don't look back. Stay in the Word of God. Make things right with those you've wronged. And after you've confessed your sins, don't look back. Uh, old Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And he'll do all he can to remind you of your sins. Uh, some of the brethren may even do their best to do the bidding of Satan and bring up your past to you. Sometimes people will say things to you, bring things up to you that, you know, they, maybe they didn't really mean, intend any evil intent. But uh, they may say some things uh, off the cuff or just uh, without thinking. And the devil can use that to make you feel guilty about what you've done in the past that you've already been forgiven for and made right with the Lord. Um, it's impossible to erase your memory of your sins, but we have to learn to respond to our memories of past sins in a spiritual way. If we recall some sin with excitement and enjoyment, then we didn't really judge it and confess it like we should have. But if we have a memory of sin that causes us shame and disgrace, then we're moving in the right direction spiritually. One, one old saying is that uh, uh, you can't get rid of your demons if you still enjoy their company. Same thing with old sins. You can't get rid of your old sins and get victory over them if you're still enjoying their company. Amen. Uh, David said in one place, he said to God, he said, that he's, uh, or David said that in the psalm, he said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God's not going to hear me, hear my prayers. And I can't get my prayers answered. I've got to confess that. I've got to, I've got to root that sin out of my heart and not be regarding it and not be uh, coddling it and enjoying it. Uh, there ought to be shame and disgrace associated with sin if you've repented of it properly. Uh, the memory of past sins ought to drive us to our knees and prayer in order to thank God for his mercy and his forgiveness that he's given us. Uh, it ought to make us hate our sin that much more and to love the Lord Jesus Christ that much more, knowing he's forgiven us of our sins. Um, a couple old sayings are like go like this. When Satan reminds you of your sin, remind him of Calvary. Amen. When he brings up your sins, you say, now wait a minute. You point him to the cross. And then say, Jesus Christ, he's my advocate. And he died for all my sins. And guess what? He's paid for all of them. And I'm forgiven. Amen. And I don't have to carry that guilt around anymore. Uh, when Satan reminds you of your sin, remind him of Calvary. Uh, when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Amen. Amen. Tell him where to go, amen? <laughs> Tell him where he's going, amen? Tell him where he's going. Um, God's got a place prepared for him, amen? It's called hell. And uh, now God has forgiven you. He's cast your sins behind his back into the sea of his forgetfulness, and he's posted a no fishing sign around it. So don't go fishing up your past, amen? Um, the Bible says this, my trans Job said, my transgression is sealed up in a bag. And thou sowest up mine iniquity. Isaiah said, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness. But thou, O God, hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. You can't see behind your back. God cast them behind his back. He can't even see your sins anymore. Amen? Amen. He's sown them up. He's sealed them up. He's, he's tossed them behind his back. And then Micah chapter 7 says this, that uh, God will have compassion on us. He'll subdue our iniquities. And thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. God says, I'll just take your sins. I'm going to sack them up, seal them up, sew them up, cast them behind my back, and drop them in the sea out there. Never to be heard from again. So guess what? Don't go fishing, amen? No fishing allowed. God's forgiven you. Forget it. And go on. So now, God's forgiven you. Don't look back. Keep moving forward, amen? Another thing you can do is this. Uh, to enjoy God's forgiveness... Number four, you're going to have to forgive others who've wronged you. Forgive others who've wronged you. We talked about apologizing and getting things right with those we've offended. But there's those who have wronged you and offended you. You've got to forgive them too. Uh, one of the signs of a forgiven person is their willingness to forgive others. Uh, Jesus told a parable of that in Matthew chapter 18 where he said that he forgave one man something like $10 million debt that would have landed him in jail the rest of his life 
and he was so thankful for it that he went out to his people, the people that owed him money, and they owed him like ten bucks, and he was ready to throw them in prison. And the the, the, the servants went back to the master and said, you know what so-and-so's doing? Remember that guy you forgave that huge debt from? Yeah, I remember him. He said, he's out here just uh, trying to get the last, squeeze the last dime out of every poor person out here that owes him something. And he's threatening to do what you were going to do with him. The Lord wasn't happy with that. Thought that was hypocrisy. And the other guy got in trouble and held to account for acting like that. So you can be forgiven by God, and if you go out and act contrary to what God did for you and forgiven you, and you're an unforgiving soul, you're not very Christ-like. And God doesn't approve of that. People say, well, can you rob a bank and still be saved? Of course you can. Can you kill somebody and still be saved? Yes, you can. Can I get saved and maybe later on rob a bank and go to heaven? Yeah, you could probably do that. If you've got eternal security, you could do that. That's the answer to that question. Can I kill somebody and still go to heaven? Yes, you can. But you probably won't. Unless you're not robbing God. And then, guess what? If you do that, so what's going to happen to me then? You're going to go to prison for the rest of your life. Yeah. Praise God. <laughs> Amen? you still got eternal security, but God didn't let you get away with that down here, so now you're going to go through a living hell down here before you go to heaven. There are a lot of people in prison like that. And by the way, I've always learned this. Murderers aren't really that dangerous unless they're mad at you. <laughs> Amen? If they're mad at you, they'll leave you alone. They only kill people they're mad at, amen? So just don't make them mad. Um, forgiven others who have wronged you. That's a sign of someone who has been forgiven. Uh, again, the gist of that story, Matthew 18, is there's a difference between getting forgiveness and giving forgiveness. A person can give forgiveness, but that doesn't mean the offender receives it all the time. Sometimes he might resent you forgiving him and reject your forgiveness because his heart isn't right with God. He's bitter himself. He's bitter. And a person may repent of what he's done to another and his apology not be accepted because the offended party's still bitter and unwilling to forgive because he isn't right with God. Um, you know, many people, when you try to forgive them, um, uh, they won't accept your forgiveness. And it works the other way, too. Sometimes you try to get forgiveness and you can't get forgiveness. Sometimes you try to give forgiveness and they won't accept that forgiveness. Many people just want to keep you in debtor's prison until you've done enough penance to satisfy uh, their desire for payback. You know, this, they won't forgive you. They'll hold, it, they'll hold it against you for a long time. They'll hold that grudge against you. And you try to forgive them, try to make it right, and they just won't accept it. Because they're bitter. They're bitter. But no Christian ought to be that way. No Christian ought to be that way. A Christian ought to be one who can forgive, and a Christian ought to be one who can accept forgiveness from somebody. But sometimes, you know, you want to you you forgive somebody for what they've done to you, but they don't want to accept it because they're not right. You know, God wants to forgive people for what they've done to him. And the multitudes have rejected his forgiveness. They don't want his forgiveness. And many times it's because they don't think they've done him wrong. You know how sometimes people won't accept your forgiveness? Because they've not admitted themselves yet that they did you wrong. You, you got some people in your family like that? Among your friends like that? You'd like to forgive, but they don't want to be forgiven because they haven't done nothing wrong. You know they have, but they, they don't see they've done anything wrong. There's something wrong with them. That's the problem. Um, now, let me say this. We can't harbor malice towards others and enjoy God's forgiveness. So if you're mad at somebody else and won't forgive them, you can't enjoy God's forgiveness. If you've done somebody wrong and won't accept somebody's apology and their forgiveness, you can't enjoy God's forgiveness either. It works both ways. It's a two-way street. Colossians 3 and verse 13, Paul said this, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Forbearing one another. That word forbear means to be patient and to withhold judgment and spare someone from your wrath, even though they deserve it. That's to, for, that's to put up with. Sometimes you just got to put up with the brethren, Amen. Sometimes you've got to put up with your family and your friends. Uh, there are some people, I don't know how in the world they have friends, but people put up with them. Amen? And that's what you've got to do. And forgiving one another. To forgive somebody means to pardon them. It means to overlook an offense and treat the offender as if he was not guilty. That's what forgiveness is. 
And he says, you need to forbear and forgive one another if any man have a quarrel against any. What's a quarrel? It's a heated disagreement or argument, uh, mostly over trivial issues. And it's usually between people who are usually on good terms. That's what a quarrel is. That's fussing, and fighting, and bickering among your family, among your friends, among church members, and things like that. And you can't let that stuff, uh, you can't let that stuff continue to fester or it'll create some massive problems. Best thing to do is make it right. Get it right. Don't hold a grudge and forgive and accept forgiveness. Uh, then lastly, let me say this. If you want to enjoy God's forgiveness, stay in the Word of God. Make things right with those you've offended. Uh, forgive those who've offended you. And then uh, do something for God. Do something for God because He's done something for you. Uh, forgiveness makes us grateful. And gratefulness leads to gratitude. And gratitude wants to do something in return. When you're grateful for what somebody's done for you, you want to do something in return to them. If somebody gives you a nice gift, you tell them thank you. And you might want to try to get them something back at some point. Why? Because you, you, want, to, you want to reciprocate that. Because they were nice to you, you want to be nice to them. God's been good to you, you want to be good to Him. God's done something for you, you ought to want to do something for Him. Amen. Um, when at the, the woman at the well in John chapter 4, uh, the Lord cleansed her, healed her, not healed her, but He forgave her. And guess what? She went out and told other people. John chapter 8, the adulterous woman, he told her, he said, uh, uh, go and sin no more. I bet she did go and sin no more. She didn't go, out, she didn't go back to that life he rescued her from. Um, in John chapter 9, you got the blind man there that, God, that Christ healed him. And when he was healed, the Lord taught, he went out and told folks what happened. He went back to his church, man, the synagogue, and said, hey, guess what? I just met Jesus and he saved me. He healed me. And they were like, he can't do that. Was that on the Sabbath day? Who's this guy? You know, well, you didn't hear that at our church. Well, no, I didn't hear it at our church. I heard from him. I've met people that heard how to get saved, and they got saved as a minister of this church and went back to their church that didn't preach the gospel. Talk, there's something wrong with that, man. Why would you go, go someplace that doesn't preach the gospel? But anyway, uh, you want to do something for God. And uh, you take in uh, the cleansed leper, Mark chapter 1. Uh, Christ healed him. And he said, now go to the priest first and don't tell anybody what I did for you. You know what he did? He went out and told everybody what Christ did for him. He couldn't keep his mouth shut, amen? He went out and did that. The, the maniac of Gadara said, Lord, after he cast out the demons and healed him, he said, Lord, I want to go with you. He said, no, you go home to your friends and tell your friends what good things God's done for you. And that's what he did. But he wanted to do something. I'll, I'll, I'll just bet this. I'll bet that when you got saved... You probably told somebody what Jesus did for you. I bet you when you got saved, you told, you told your mom and your daddy. You told your aunt and your uncle, your grandma and grandpa maybe. You told your friends at school. You told the people you worked with. You told, I bet you told somebody you got saved when you got saved. Now, maybe you've backslidden since then. You ain't telling them now, but I bet you when you first got saved, you wanted to tell people. You wanted to do something for the Lord. Uh, in some cultures, if someone has wronged another and the victim of their offense forgives them instead of judging them, they show their gratitude by becoming their servant for life. That's some cultures. Um, I remember, uh, remember the book, The Count of Monte Cristo? How many remember the book, The Count of Monte Cristo? How many have ever seen the book? It's about that thick. I've seen the movie. That's my next year's project. Yeah, I've just seen the movie, so I'm going to quote you the movie. But anyway, uh, I don't know if this is in the book or not, but in the movie version of it, Edmund Dantes, he's the hero, the Count of Monte Cristo, he escapes the prison. And uh, he swims to shore. And he's rescued by some pirates on the beach. And uh, there's a man there by the name of Jacopo. And he's in the book. And anyway, Jacopo there, somehow they get him lined up, or, or set up to fight Edmund Dantes, there, who's just come, off, come out of the water and uh, escaped the prison. And... Um, so they get in a knife fight. I forget what, the, what brings it about, but they get in a knife fight. And uh, Edmund Dante, the hero, he gets the better of the Jacopo, the pirate. And when he does, it's a knife fight. He has his knife over him, and he's ready to kill him. And all the pirates are like, kill him, kill him. That's what you're supposed to kill him. You get him down, you kill him. We don't spare anybody. So he takes the knife, and he comes down at him, and he lands the knife right beside his head. Then he gets up. He said, I'm going to spare you. And when he does, the Jacopo gets up. No, you're supposed to kill me. He says, I'm not going to kill you. And when he gets up, he says, I am your servant forever, Master. And at that point there, he serves him for the rest of his life. Why? Because he spared his life. 
Now, that's similar to what happens to us when God forgives us instead of judging us. We become the Lord's bond servants. Uh, we serve him from a grateful heart for him being such a merciful God. And we literally owe to the Lord Jesus Christ our lives and our eternities. He could have destroyed us. He could have damned us. Do you know he forgave us, he showed us mercy, and he spared our life. He could have brought judgment on us, but he didn't. He, the judgment fell on Christ at Calvary. And if we'll accept that, then we, can, then we can experience God's mercy and his goodness and his loving kindness. Amen. And because of that, in our hearts, guess what? We were the servants of sin, but now we're the servants of righteousness. And now we serve God because of what he's done for us. And he's our master, he's our Lord. We serve him because he spared us. Amen? Let me close by saying this. Forgiveness is a pardon. It's not a probation. A pardon means it's as if you didn't do it. I release you from all responsibility, and, I, and we're, we're going to forgive and forget. Uh, forgiveness is not probation. It's not putting you on, on a trial saying, well, now, if you'll do right for the next 30 days, then maybe I'll release you from your obligations and I'll forgive you. No, forgiveness takes place like that. Takes place like that. And sometimes when you forgive, it just feels like a... When you forgive someone else what they've done for you, uh, done against you, many times that's a burden lifted off of you. And when you accept the forgiveness somebody gives you because you offended them, that's another burden lifted off somebody's shoulders. And you just feel better, amen? You don't feel like you're walking around, you know, with a, a weight... Uh, all over you all the time, pressing you down all the time. That's what guilt will do. But forgiveness is not probation, it's restoration. And that should cause us to want to rejoice, amen? God's not put us on probation, he's restored us. He's reconciled us. He saved us. And he forgave us the moment we repented and acknowledged our sinfulness to him and received Christ. It's been said that the most Christ-like thing that you can do is to forgive someone else. Why? Because that's what God did. God forgave us. And that's one of his attributes is he forgives. He's merciful. And we ought to be the same way. Amen? We ought to forgive one another, and we ought to accept forgiveness when somebody wants to forgive us for what they've done to us. Amen? And uh, that would make the world a whole better place, wouldn't it? If people would forgive one another, this world would be livable. Amen? Amen. A lot of it has to do with just facts that just, people are just mean. They're holding grudges. They don't want to make things right. They don't want to get things right. And they go through life like that, and it, it, it hurts them, and it hurts everyone around them. So let's be like the Bible says, let's forgive one another for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our time of invitation. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us to come to meet together. Thank you, God, for the scripture, for the Bible, for your word that we can preach today. We thank you for this uh, thing called forgiveness. We thank you, God, that you forgave us at the cross. And that, Father, for those of us who received Jesus Christ as our Savior, we've received your forgiveness. And we can know that we're saved eternally. Father, we uh, pray, God, you might help us, Lord, not to just be saved, but, Lord, to be saved and in fellowship with you and with our fellow believers. God, help us to make sure that our hearts are right with you and right with those around us. And, God, we pray, Father, for those that uh, we may have offended. God, help us to... Make the apologies necessary, and Lord, those that offended us, we pray, God, that you might help us to forgive them in spite of them holding a grudge against us for whatever reason it might be. But God, help us to stay right with you. Help us to stay right with those around us as best as we can. Help us do as the Bible says and to live peaceably with all men as much as lieth in us. Father, we pray that you'll bless the time of invitation, time of prayer now in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and our eyes closed while the music plays, you pray. anything between you and God now is the time to make it right and if there's anything between you and another you need to plan to make that thing right get it right life will be much better for you and those around you to get that burden off of you if you've never been saved there's a burden of guilt that is pressing down on you the Holy Spirit of God will convict you he'll let you know that you need to be forgiven that you need to be saved let me say this, if you're listening today and you feel your need of God's forgiveness of your sins, that's the Holy Spirit convicting you. And you need to repent of your sin 
acknowledge it to God, admit it to God, and then accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're willing to admit that you're a sinner in need of God's forgiveness, and you'll receive Christ and ask Him to save you, He'll do it. And you can know your sins are forgiven. You can know you have eternal home in heaven if you'll do that. And that burden of guilt will be lifted. But you've got to receive Christ and His forgiveness. Father, help me thank you for this day once again and for your blessings. And we ask God that you might dismiss us now with your blessings. We pray, God, that uh, you bless the message, what's been said. May it be a help to anyone who's heard today. And Father, may it improve someone's life, their spiritual life, their family, or their place of work, or whatever it might be. We pray, God, that Christians might be in fellowship with each other and serving you together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed.